Good morning, students. Well, we're, we're still in our winter weather mode and um, supposedly it will get a little bit cool, actually a little bit warmer as the week uh, progresses and unfortunately a little bit more rain, but um, it's always nice to, to have a cooler, cooler time. Again, I hope uh, you're taking good care of yourselves. Um, I, I have to follow all of the advice that I give you all because uh, busy time of the year. I mean, fall semester is always busy and with holidays approaching and uh, holiday music that Professor Ron is involved in, it, it, our, our time is, is valuable to us. So uh, just remember that tomorrow uh, the window will open for uh, your final exam and you'll have the uh, same window as you've had for all of your tests. That is, we'll start tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. and go till uh, Thursday, 11 p.m. So again, a very large window of time to give you plenty of flexibility. Obviously, you have uh, many, uh, many obligations to complete as, as you uh, complete your uh, fall semester at San Jacinto College. So again, Remember, uh, your last homeworks are due uh, tomorrow. That is uh, for the last couple of sections that we've done at 11 p.m. So make every effort uh, to meet that deadline. Uh, that, way, that way you can now focus on uh, just systematic review for the test. Like I said before, um, review things where you feel like you need uh, to, to brush up. Uh, things that you already know are going to stay there because they're in your long-term memory. So what I want to do today is go over some examples uh, from the practice test uh, that I uh, made available to you. And uh, what I found is that as you, as you go back through the examples and things, I think you'll find that, that the material that's basically moved into your long-term memory is still there. You just need to brush up a little bit on it. And then of course the newest material uh, is fresh. Uh, that is if you've actually covered it. So, so I don't think you'll find that the, the polar coordinates and the calculus is as, as difficult as the infinite series, uh, but it is a little bit different. And, and you know, trigonometry, you either love trigonometry or you don't. I mean, it's it's a it's a win lose type situation. I've never I've never met too many students that were in the middle. They either said they love trig or they didn't. So uh, uh, wherever you fall, just know enough trig to to get you to the next level. So what I want to do is is basically go through the uh, practice test. I've written up solutions that I've also made available to you, but I want to just basically go through uh, the solutions to apprise you. Uh, basically of what we've done this term. So also as you, as you review, go back through quizzes, uh, go back through uh, old tests and just spot check, pick a problem that you haven't done in a while or, or something that's gotten a little bit old on the brain, so to speak, and, and just work through it. That's the best way to make sure that, that you're in good shape for the test. And unfortunately, uh, there is no magic uh, potion. I, I wish there were, I'd make it available to you. So now let me uh, share my screen. Now, what I have here, I've got all the solutions worked out and I wanna go through them, but this practice test was basically just set up to give you kind of a snapshot of all the different types of things we've done. So I'm not going to, make a, a final exam that, that will just, you know, every, every problem is earth shattering. Basically the final exam will test you on the basic ideas that we have learned during the course. And again, <clears throat> the new stuff will be uh, shown on the test, but, but to not such a level that, that it just pushes everything else away. So don't expect there to be just these huge number of problems on the new material, just a very even distribution is what you'll find. So what I wanna do is just go through these uh, as we see them on the practice test. Now, the first one, again, the very first thing we did when we started the course and the, the first problem is very straightforward is that we looked at the inverse trig functions. 
And let me just go ahead and remind you of those. The very first one that we have on the test look like this. That is, we have the integral du u the square root of u squared minus a squared. And that was the inverse secant form. So we get one over a, and this was the most difficult to derive. Remember, you can write all of the elementary functions in terms of the hyperbolics, the inverse, the exponential and the trig functions. I mean, you, you have learned so much about series. Now you could read a treatise on infinite series and, and be surprised how much you know and, and how you can take that to the next level. And if you like, maybe become a double major in math, but, but I won't push it. So we'll have absolute value of u divided by a plus a constant. So these were the first things we did in the class. And again, these are basically uh, the integration table. So as you work your problems on the test, you can certainly use uh, your integration table. That's always available to you on the final exam. Uh, of course, using the integration table requires that you understand what you're doing, but, but that, that's gonna be a bonus that you will have available to you. Now, the other one, or two more, the integral of du, a squared plus u squared, that will be one over a, the inverse tangent. And the, the theory of the inverse trig functions is very rich as we know and, and very useful, especially in engineering and, and the sciences. And then of course, the very last one, where it all began, so to speak, the inverse sine form. And remember the one over A uh, uh, absorbed in this case, so we don't have that here. That's one thing that's interesting about this particular form. So these are what we derived uh, the very first day of class, and I just wanted to remind you of them. And of course, when you uh, look at your integral tables in the basic forms, you see these listed in the one through 20. But of course, the, the ebook uh, integration tables, you have pretty much focus on the, the ideas that, that, that you don't always remember, and, and of course can be of a, a great use to you. So now, for the very first one, and I'll just cover these as we go through them. The first one's simple. That is, when we have the integral dx of x times the square root of 81 x squared minus 5. The first thing we want to do, of course, as you remember, is to write this in the standard form. And so now what we can see is if we write the 81x squared as a quantity squared, and then of course the five as a perfect square, we get the square root of five squared, and of course nine x squared. So very simple. At this point, you probably look at this and yawn because you've done so many more complicated things. And so now, of course, we need to make sure that we're table ready. So first, we notice that the du is nine dx. So we go ahead and put in the nine here uh, with the dx, but also know that we need a nine here for the U in our uh, formula. So these, these basically absorb. So we don't really have to do anything but multiply and divide, so to speak. So that's kind of a freebie there. And now, of course, this is table ready. And now I will also say this, you know, WebAssign doesn't care how beautiful your answer is. As long as it's correct, you get a check. So in this particular case, we have one over a, which is one over the square root of five times the inverse secant, secant of the absolute value of nine x divided by the square root of five plus a constant. Now, of course, you can slap the absolute values on the entire argument here if you like. And then of course, when you look at the response here on the test, everything's rationalized, which is fine, but that doesn't make it any more correct. So I like, I like the fact that the practice test kind of keeps you 
uh, on the straight and narrow, and also reminds you that, that as you work problems with antiderivatives, remember that, that functions possessing the same derivative differ by a constant. So sometimes you can have equivalent antiderivatives that don't look at all alike. And you're thinking, well, someone did something wrong when actually, in actuality, uh, both uh, responses are correct. Now for the next one, just a very simple uh, calculation here. We have the derivative of the inverse sine of 6x plus 3 divided by 5. Again, very rudimentary, just to, just to apprise you of, of the derivative of the inverse sine. And in this particular case, remember what we have to do is we've got to take the derivative of this particular quantity, but divide by 1 minus the quantity squared to the 1 half power. But what's nice about this, the derivative you can easily see is just 6 over 5, uh, the 3 fifths just going to 0. So here's our derivative. And then when we square things, we just get 6x plus 3 quantity squared divided by 25. So very, very, very simple. But again, something we haven't done uh, in the recent past. Boy, we've been doing so many uh, binomial theories and things of that nature and the polar coordinates that we've left this way behind. Now, uh, upon uh, reduction here, we can get a common denominator of 25. So this is one over what we would say, one over one over 25 in square root, which is just one over one over five, which is just in this case, multiplication by five. And then of course, the radical has been reduced to this. And then of course, we still have the six fifths hanging out. But then of course, the fives absorb and we're left with this. So again, to be completely honest with you, if, if you took a derivative, I mean, you know, it, that would be harder to actually enter, but, but if you don't want to take the time to reduce, this is certainly a correct answer. Um, we like to make our answers look beautiful in calculus, but that's certainly not always the case. Uh, I finally convinced some of my pre-cal students that they didn't have to rationalize uh, denominators anymore and just to leave it and move forward. And they, they thought, oh, my life is so much better now. I, I'm not sure why they never understood that. Now, for the next example, these are kind of the fun problems that we did when we started chapter seven. And, and I think this is a really good example. It says, calculate the area of the region bounded by the graphs of the given equations. Now, notice here, and, and remember, this is really a college algebra problem because you could, have, you could have found the intersections of these curves in college algebra. But what's nice about this, we, we realized in this class that the use of symmetry is, is really tantamount to making the calculation simple. And we all go for simplicity. So notice both of these functions are even, both are even. And so, so we know that the zeros or the intersection points will be symmetrically distributed about the origin so that we can already look at this and say, well, we're gonna use some symmetry. So when we look at this particular problem, let me just go ahead and uncover it. Note what I've had here is both curves have y-axis symmetry. So the first thing we want to do is compute an intersection point. So we just set the curves equal. So we have 1f x squared equals the negative of x squared plus 6. Now, of course, if we multiply through by 2, we'll just get an x squared minus 2x squared plus 12. And then, of course, transpose here to get 3x squared equals 12. And then, of course, the 3s uh, absorb, and we just have x squared equals 4. But how simple. That's just a difference of two squares. And like I said, we expect that the zeros uh, to be uh, symmetrically distributed about the origin. So of course, we're going to get plus or minus two. And so it's amazing when I write up solutions and I write up things, uh, my work astounds me in, in the level of consistency. Uh, I, I never err from the, the, the approach that I take when I teach a class because it's important to be consistent. Of course, we can leave out some steps, but, but the consistency is important. So what did Professor Ron always say? Okay, well, let's just let X live between zero and two 
and then double the result. That is use the symmetry of the actual uh, region, which we don't even need to draw because it's so simple. We clearly see that this is the upper curve and this is the lower curve. That's, that's clear. So now what is our formula? That is we take double the result of the integral from zero to two of the upper curve minus the lower curve, okay? So we found, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, in a lot of these problems, the algebra is easy, but the arithmetic is insane. I mean, fractions on top of fractions, no matter what you do. So, so again, just take your time to get a reasonable result. So when we look at this particular um, uh, algebra here, we combine these two terms to get a negative three halves x squared plus a six. Now we can apply uh, uh, the power rule, add one divided by the new power. So of course the new power here will be three. So that means multiplication by one third. And then of course this six just becomes six x. So notice now the three's absorbed and we're left with a negative one half x cubed plus a six x. At this point, we can just apply the fundamental theorem. Now, again, let me stress what's very important here, ladies and gentlemen. Using the symmetry means we have a lower limit of zero. Zero is our friend, and we want to use any kind of symmetry we can to simplify things. So please always be on the outlook for that. So now we notice with the zero, this just annihilates this. So we're just interested in the two. So we get negative one half times two cubed plus six times two, which is a 12. Notice here the two absorbs into the eight to give us a negative four. And then of course a negative four plus 12 is eight and two times eight is 16. So again, very straightforward, but a problem that gives plenty of, of reminders of some of the techniques that we use over and over. I will say this, if you're not sure about a symmetry, don't use it. I don't, I, no need to, to miss the problem uh, with, with, with assumptions that, that maybe there's little confidence to move forward. But, but again, we've done this enough that hopefully you will feel levels of confidence to allow you to uh, make the problem a little bit more efficient. Now, this next problem I actually kind of like. You know, and here's another thing. It says use the shell method. And of course, I'm going to use the shell method just to review it. But you, when you're working a test, you can use any method you like. I mean, that, the, the problem may be trying to help you out by saying use a particular method because it's actually a simpler method. So always keep that in mind when you're trying to navigate these problems. So it says use the shell method to find the volume of the solid generated by revolving the region bounded by the given curves about the y-axis. Okay, now notice here, and this is, this is a really a nice problem. Lots of times when the, when the region is symmetric about the axis, that is you've got the same uh, setup on either side, then you just, you're just revolving one part, obviously, not the whole thing. But the way this problem is set up, it, it does that restriction for you because you don't have a symmetric region. So it's specifying that X be non-negative, okay? So that's a really big uh, restriction there. So when we look at this particular problem, ladies and gentlemen, notice first that we need the intersection of these two uh, uh, curves, one linear, uh, one quadratic. Again, very simple, setting the curves equal, X squared is equal to five X plus six. And then of course, transposing gives us a very simple uh, Professor Ron AC lemma. So we can use a negative one and a six to get the negative five here. So this will give us uh, intersection, at least for the X solution, six and negative one. But of course, we're not interested in the negative one because of this restriction. So of course now, you don't need to really do any more. We can just select X to live between zero and six. And now, of course, if you would like to draw a picture, you can notice at zero, we just get six. And I'm not drawing this, you know, to, as Rembrandt. And then, of course, uh, at six here, we get 36. So you use your imagination that my scale is uh, actually correct here. But the shell method basically just says, okay, 
we want to be able to revolve this rectangle, which is parallel to the axis of revolution about the y axis. So of course, what's nice about this, the distance to the axis of revolution is just x. And then of course, the length or the height of the strip is just the upper curve minus the lower curve, which we get six plus five x minus x squared. So again, this problem is relatively simple to set up. There's just a little bit more algebra or arithmetic in the computation. However, notice the lower limit is zero and that annihilates everything. So, so we're happy with that. So let's go ahead and look at this. We have the concomitant two pi. Remember with the disk method, you have pi, but with the shell method, you get the two pi. So don't forget that, put that on your note card. And then of course, we have the distance to the axis of revolution times the height of the strip. And that will give us, in this case, a negative x cubed plus a 5x squared plus a 6x. Now notice this is just a simple power rule, add one divide by the new power. So this will give us a negative x to the fourth divided by four, a 5 thirds x cubed. And then of course, this will give us a 6x squared divided by two, which reduces to 3x squared. And then of course, we can evaluate between zero and six. Of course, now this being annihilated at the lower limit, so we're good with that. So with the six, we'll get negative six to the fourth divided by four plus five times six to the third divided by three plus three times six squared. And of course, uh, Professor Ron uh, factors everything uh, to, to death because that's what he likes to do and that's what you should like to do also. So notice, Notice here, uh, first, we've got a six squared and everything, which I don't touch, okay? But then notice we can write the extra stuff if we like uh, to reduce these. So we have a two times a three, a two times a three, and here we have a two times a three and then a three. Notice, notice here, by doing this, we can absorb the four and we're just left with a nine with a negative extracting the six squared in each of these terms to give us this to join the two pi. And then of course here, the three absorbs and we're left with the two times the five, which is the 10 and then a three. So this factorization makes this trivial. Again, factoring, factoring will often help you, not always, but it will often help you. And so now when you look at this, you're like, well, that's easy. I've just got 13 minus nine, which is four. And then I'm thinking, okay, well, what is that gonna do for me? Well, I've got a four here. And then of course, notice 36 times two is 72. And that makes a simple arithmetic calculation. Uh, four times the two is eight. And then of course, four times uh, seven is 28 or 288 pi. So again, um, a very straightforward example that again, exemplifies all of the interesting algebraic maneuvers that we do when we try to find volumes of solids of revolution. Now you have to admit, it's such a simple concept. You know, we, we reserve all of this for uh, calculus too, but we could have done it in Cal 1. It's just, like I say, all the courses are so full of topics that we can't even think about putting additional topics into Cal 1 and even hope to finish. Same thing with Cal 2. If they ever wanted to try to add topic Cal 2, uh, I would be the first to say, well, there's no room. Back in the dark ages, we used to set up calculus in four courses where you would do linear algebra and differential equations as a combo in those four courses. I don't know if it were any easier, but it, it seemed it, th though that were the case because of the four as opposed to three, but I don't know. Maybe that's the old school. Now, the next problem, often, you know, we thought at first we always drew a picture, but this, this is one of my favorite problems that we do uh, when we move liquids around. And we don't even really need to draw a, 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 a box in this case because it's set up so neatly in our brain. So notice we have a swimming pool that has a rectangular base, 14 feet by 28 feet. And it says the sides are six feet high and the pool is half full, okay? So you're thinking we're gonna go from uh, 
zero to six on the y-axis, but the limits of integration will only run from zero to three because the, uh, the tank, so to speak, is only half full. So that, that vision is already in our mind's eye. And then it says compute the work to empty the pool by pumping water out over the top. So this is exactly like the web assign problem. And then notice here, uh, I have rho is equal to 62.4 uh, pounds per cubic foot, but all these answers are listed in terms of rho. So I'm sparing you the computation of multiplying by 62.4, which again is not a big deal, but, but it, you know, if, if, if a particular Greek letter is used uh, in a calculation, then, then go for it, the, use it and, and, and avoid having to do the computation like you do with the, uh, the centers of mass. Now, when we look at this particular example, notice here, I've gone ahead and just put everything together. As I said before, the tank is only half full. So we're gonna start zero at the bottom of the tank and go up uh, to the height, which is six, when we are considering the distance to move the slab of water, but the limits of integration will only be zero to three. That's very important and a, and a common error in this type of problem. Now, what about, how do, how do we do this? Well, we're thinking about the actual uh, volume of the slab. So this is gonna be 14 times 28 times delta Y. And then we think, well, what's the force exerted by the slab? Well, it's just the volume times the weight density that we have here. And then of course, as we think about the actual uh, uh, location of the slab, it would be some Y in here between zero and three. So the distance would just be six minus the Y, that is from the top of the tank down to the slab that is located at the Y coordinate Y in this case. So this is a common example that we do that now seems almost trivial. So now to get the work, this is the work for the slab. So we wanna add all of these uh, infinitesimal slabs of work to get the entire work to move all half of the contents of the tank up to the top of the tank. So again, this would be work is zero to three. And then we just fill all of this in 14 times 28 times rho times six minus y dy. Now, of course, I did all this in symbolic calculation. All of these are constants, so we can remove them to the uh, left of the integral sign, but notice that this is a very simple antiderivative. Notice we have the negative y here, so we need the negative dy in the differential. Of course, we have to pay for this with the negative here. So now you can see, okay, yay, lower limit of zero, so we add one divided by the new power. So this gives us six minus y quantity squared divided by two. And then of course, we evaluate from zero to three. But again, be very careful. Uh, notice here, we don't get the zeroing out. So don't just assume since you have a zero that you get zero. So this is very different based upon the way we actually computed the antiderivative. Because again, we get lazy. We don't want to have to break this up and do extra work that is unnecessary. So now we substitute three, and this will give us six minus three quantity squared. And notice here, I just went ahead and absorbed the two into the 14 to get the negative seven times the 28 row. And then of course, substituting the zero will give us six minus zero squared. So now, if you will, we have a three squared right here, which is a nine. And here we have a six squared here, uh, which is a 36. But of course, when you, when you look at this and you think about what we did before, this is three squared times two squared. So if you extract the negative and the nine, you just get a negative nine times the negative 196 rho, which is the seven times the 28 with the negative, and you're left with four minus one. So now at this point, when we think about this and we, we try to make a computation uh, that, that's simple, we think, okay, well, how can we write this so this is easy to do? Notice at this point with the 196, we can simply write the 196 as 200 minus four, and then it's easy to multiply here. 
So when we think about the 27, this will give us a 5,400 minus a four times a 27, which is 108. And in the difference, we see that we get 5,292 times rho foot pounds. Now, when you look here, this is written in terms of rho here. So that would be all the calculation that you would have to do, okay? So again, with this particular type of example, the main thing that we want to be able to do is to think about this in terms of moving the slab, the slab of water, and then summing. Again, a very simple calculation and a very useful calculation. Now let's look at number six. Not all examples have to be long-winded in the sense that, that some calculations can be very simple. Um, one thing I did try to teach you uh, with integration by parts is that there are many techniques that you can utilize with that particular method. And one is the shortcut method when it applies. Notice for this particular problem, it just says perform the integration and you have an exponential function times a polynomial. And then of course you think, well, that's the, that's the easiest one to do. I, the more complicated ones would actually require that you have to put a little more time into the integral part and more time into the derivative part. And then of course, if the integrand repeats, then you have to algebraically solve for the antiderivative, which we did a couple of times, three times in the lecture. Uh, that being not a lot of fun, but, but certainly uh, doable. So now when we look at this particular problem, we can think of just using the shortcut method. Again, we have a very simple derivative here because we've got the polynomial and we have a very simple antiderivative because we have the natural exponential. I mean, obviously, if you think about the power series, the Maclaurin series for e to the x, it has all the powers in it uh, that, that the uh, cosine and sine have. And so with Euler's formula, you actually get uh, uh, cosine and sine from the uh, natural exponential. So if that's something that's interesting to you, you should do more investigation of that. You will certainly see that in differential equations. So now what we can see is we can differentiate this polynomial, ladies and gentlemen, to zero. So we have an x squared minus two x, which gives us a two x minus six. Then we have a two and then a zero. Okay, so this stops here. So we're not gonna go any more diagonal lines. And then of course, this is the easiest antiderivative on the planet. E to the X gives us E to the X, E to the X, E to the X. No, no uh, coefficient K there to, to make any additional arithmetic uh, needed. So now we know that with the integration by parts formula that we alternate the sign. So this is a very quick way to organize your work and be done with it. Notice with the positive here, we're going to get an x squared minus a six x times e to the x. You can go ahead and factor the e to the, e to the x to give us these two terms. And then of course here we have the minus. So now when you do this, you'll get the negative of this. You'll get a positive six x minus a two x, which we have here. And then at the end, we just have the two, which we have here, all multiplied by e to the x. And then of course, if you uh, combine like terms, you've got the x squared, the minus eight x, plus eight, and then you're done. Tack on the arbitrary constant. Let me also remind you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, when you're doing the antiderivative, the arbitrary constant is part of the answer, okay? And remember in WebAssign, it's always an uppercase C, all right? Don't use a lowercase C, don't use an uppercase A or whatever, use the uppercase C. We know formatting is extremely important. And, and, and again, Mathematics, though it's very flexible, is, is precise, is precise. As STEM professionals or future STEM professionals, that precision is very important. Uh, unfortunately, it does not make for the easiest time when all of your friends are taking classes that maybe have less precision, but, but it's all good. Precision, I think, is what everybody uh, likes to have. Now, let's look at this one. We know we, we just enjoy the trig integrals. Uh, remember the Pythagorean identities, the power reducing identities. I'm sure you have these on your note cards and please have these available uh, uh, together with your uh, 
integral tables as you work through the final. Notice this particular example says is an antiderivative uh, with, with the limits. So basically this is a definite integral. We've got tangent x times secant to the fourth x dx evaluated from zero to pi over three. Well, when we look at this, ladies and gentlemen, let me move this up. What we see here is there are many ways to do this, but we always look for a simple way. And just remember, if you're doing an antiderivative, your answer may look different from your colleagues if they use a different technique. But again, when you check out the antiderivatives, you will see that they differ by a constant and are therefore valid. Now here, it doesn't really matter. We're uh, going for the uh, 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 definite integral. So what I did here was just the simplest way to do it. Notice uh, we've got uh, three powers of secant here if we take one to write the du. How simple, table ready. I mean, you just stare at it and it's table ready. It's like, here, here's a gift of a problem. We don't want you to work too hard. So now table ready, u cubed times du, add one, divide by the new power. You know, it, it's amazing. Sometimes problems that should be harder are, are so simple, you scratch your head and think, well, why can't every problem be this straightforward? The arithmetic in the, in the work problem was harder than this. And so now, of course, we just evaluate at the upper limit, that is we're gonna have secant of pi over three raised to the fourth power, of course times one fourth, minus secant of zero raised to the fourth power, of course times uh, one fourth with the negative. But of course, secant of pi over three is the reciprocal of cosine of pi over three, which is two. So again, uh, so simple. So we just get 16 over four. But of course here, the secant of zero uh, is uh, one. So again, that just gives us a negative one fourth. So 16 minus one is 15 and we get 15 over four. So that's a very nice uh, uh, application of, of differentials from uh, calculus one. Remember, our trig integrals depend really on everything we learned before. I, you don't use anything except when you get to the Wallace formulas and the, uh, the uh, reduction formulas that you use integration by parts. But usually most of the ideas you work with here, uh, you learned in your previous class. Okay, now let's look at another example. Here, and this is one I thought was really interesting, ladies and gentlemen. Notice here I said several methods will work. Choose one that you know best. And I did this one a particular way just to make a point here. Again, that, that you look at this and say, hmm, did they use parts? Did they use trig sub? I'm not sure. So, so what I did here was I addressed this problem based upon integration by parts. And then of course, the answer that I get doesn't really look like one of the selections. Of course, if, if I were in WebAssign, I would just stop here and say, I'm done. I don't care that it's not beautiful. I have bigger and better things to do. Okay, well notice first that this sets up very nicely for integration by parts. If you just write the x squared or the x cubed as x squared times x, and then of course divide uh, by the radical. This is a calculus one interval here. And of course, how simple uh, to differentiate x squared. So what I did again was just apply integration by parts. So of course this will just take one pass, but notice here, this is a, this is a really interesting uh, problem when you look at it. Notice when you take the uh, antiderivative here, add one, divide by the new power. If you make it table ready, the twos go away. And so you just end up with a radical x squared plus three. So this is, this is really a simple one. That is, notice when you pay for the uh, differential here, when you divide by the new power, it goes away. So you just get a very simple antiderivative, which is the square root of x squared plus three. And so now you're thinking, okay, we're good to go. We'll do x squared times the square root of x squared plus three, which is this term, minus the integral 2x times the square root of x squared plus three here. 
and you're thinking another gift much easier than this in the sense that this is table ready and then of course add one divide by the new power you just get what x squared plus three to the three halves uh, multiplied by two thirds with the concomitant negative the concomitant part is like it, it, it just comes along in the in the reaction process it's used often in in chemistry as an un, as an undergraduate i was fortunate to take an organic chemistry class with dr ernest elio who was one of the most famous stereochemists in the world at that time he, he discovered the boat form of cyclohexane uh, the, the the man was a giant and i was i was petrified of him um, but but that was his favorite word, and I think it stuck. But but again, uh, that at the University of North Carolina is where I actually for the first time saw mathematicians and scientists who loved what they did, and it certainly opened my eyes about academia and what you can do with education. Okay, so so now when you look at this, ladies and gentlemen, you're thinking, well, what would we do here? We would want this. Doesn't look like any of the answers that we have here. So what I did, I thought, okay, well, let's just throw caution to the wind and go ahead and make this look nice. That is, let's factor the radical here to clean this up to get a nice polynomial. So when you factor in this particular case, notice we factor the one third and the half power of x squared plus three. That's gonna leave behind a three x squared. And then of course a minus two times the factor that we did not remove. And then of course, when you combine terms, you're gonna get the x squared minus the six times this. Okay, that's cleaned up. Now what I did, I looked here at the solutions and said, these, these are not right. This is, this, is, this is like, okay, if you are completely lost, you choose these, but I know none of these are right. So I'm, clearly you look at these and say, those, those are nonsense. So now when you look at this, you're thinking, okay, this makes a little bit more sense. I'll go ahead and reduce this algebraically. So this is where I did the check here. So when you check this and actually uh, uh, factor, again, we can take out the one third and the one half power of X squared plus three and then pay for that one third. Here, of course, we just have the factor that wasn't removed. And then of course, the three times the negative three gives us this. And then of course, when we reduce this, we get the X squared minus six. So this is equivalent to A. So I thought this would just be a nice example uh, where you maybe saw this problem done by parts and then do a little bit of algebra to figure out which one to which it might be equivalent. Okay, uh, you know, again, the, the, the process of integration with the web assign is made simpler because you don't have to really work. Whatever you get, if it's equivalent to a correct response, then you're done. But I thought it might be nice to just see how we can use our factoring techniques to, to basically see that two solutions that don't even look alike are actually equivalent. And that they didn't, that the constant that by which they differed with was in this case zero. So that's interesting. Okay, so, of course, we need to throw in a little bit of, of uh, partial fractions. Remember on your third test, you had a nice partial fractions problem where you got to use differentiation. Remember I've taught you how to differentiate, especially when you get the uh, irreducible quadratic terms and the differentiation just knocks out those powers and, and you can solve easily. And then of course you set X equal to zero and, and everything goes away, uh, a, very, a very valuable technique. But in this case, this is a very straightforward problem. And then again, as you can easily see, notice uh, the denominator will clearly factor with Professor Ron's AC lemma. We can use again a negative five and a positive one uh, to give us the negative four here. And so now of course, you can just say, well, we can just break this up with partial fractions, very simple. You could almost do this in your head because you do this with telescoping series uh, in infinite series. And so of course now in this case, five X minus seven divided by X minus four times X plus one can be decomposed as A over X minus five and B over X plus one. Again, these are both linear factors. So the coefficients in these case are just A and a B, which we have to solve for obviously. 
So now what's the technique? We want to clear denominators. So we multiply through by x minus 5 times x plus 1. That gives us 5x minus 7. And then, of course, the x minus 5 absorbs. So we get a times x plus 1. And here the x plus 1 absorbs, and we get b times x minus 5. So here we don't have to differentiate. We just choose some real simple values. Uh, for instance, here, if we want to annihilate a, we can use x equal negative 1. So that'll be a negative 5 minus a 7, which is a negative 12. And then, of course, here with the negative 1, we get b times a negative 6. Of course, if we uh, divide in this case, the negatives absorb and we have b equals 2. That was easy enough. Now, of course, you could back substitute, but we're, we're going to be lazy and just annihilate the b with x equal 5. And so if that's the case, then we just get a 5 plus a 1, which gives us a 6. And then, of course, the 5 here uh, will give us a, uh, it, excuse me, in this case, a 25 minus 7, which is 18. Upon division by 6, we get A is equal to 3. So again, very straightforward. Um, I, I think the, the example that you have, examples that you have in your notes, uh, go through a couple of those and, and you'll be fine. Integration by parts, again, very straightforward. We spent so much time on that. I can't imagine that that would ever get rusty, uh, but I know it can. So now, of course, we just take these. We have A is equal to 3, so we get the integral of 3 uh, divided by x minus 5 dx. And then, of course, B is equal to 2, so we get the integral of 2 divided by x plus 1 dx. And then, of course, these are just du over u. So we get 3 times the natural log of x minus 5 plus 2 times the natural log of x plus 1 plus an arbitrary constant. So, so again, enjoy these as being straightforward, but, but very, very good review that just apprise you of the myriad techniques you've learned in this class. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. We, we have, we've just kind of taken what we learned in Cal 1 and Pre-Cal and we molded things in a certain way to give us new ways to attack sequences and series and to attack other integrals and things. Uh, and then of course the polar coordinates and the per parametric representations just use the calculus we've already learned. So, so we really have been uh, pretty good about using what we've learned uh, to maximize uh, our output. Now, for the next one, this is just a simple L'Hopital's rule. You had several of these in your quizzes and your homework, and of course on your test, which uh, can, can be very, very much fun. Now notice here, let's just go ahead and move this up. We'll have the limit as x approaches zero of cosine 3x minus 1 divided by x squared. Well, of course, you know, we always try substitution, but upon substituting, we get a 0 over 0, which is indeterminate. So we can apply L'Hopital. Okay, so that means we take the derivative of the numerator and the denominator. So, of course, here we'll get a negative 3 sine 3x since the derivative of the cosine is the negative sign, and then, of course, the chain rule on a 2x. Again, we pass to the limit again. Notice that we get 0 over 0. Remember that geometric problem we did where we differentiate, applied L'Hopital's rule maybe four or five times? That, I won't do that to you. That was, you can do that problem. This is walking in the park. We apply L'Hopital again. So in this particular case, uh, we're going to have the cosine of 3x times 3 hit the negative 3 here to give us a negative 9 cosine 3x, of course, divided by 2. Now we can pass to the limit by continuity. And clearly here, we'll get a negative 9 over 2. So that's a very straightforward application of um, uh, L'Hopital. Now, the next problem is basically what we've already seen in doing arc length calculations. And it's not that we're being lazy when we don't write the improper integral. It's just that when you have an infinite discontinuity like this, ladies and gentlemen, you see that you're going to repair the process because you're going to move the radical upstairs upon anti-differentiation. So I'm not being sloppy when I just appear to be mowing over this. This is something we see with arc length calculations. And so it's okay. You, you, you notice the situation 
and then you perform the actual antiderivative and see that you can pass to the limit. So this is not being, you know, negligent and doing poor mathematics. It's just that you reach a certain level where you notice this and, and you, don't, you don't worry, you know this is going to converge. But if we wanted to be completely uh, pedantic about this, we can see as we approach two from the left, in this particular case, that this becomes an infinite discontinuity. So, so what we want to do here, notice, is just notice that we have the actual inverse sine form. The inverse sine form, if for instance, the radical doesn't go upstairs like it did with the other, it, it's just that it goes away in this case because this is the inverse sine form. Now notice we have an a equal to two and we have a u equal to x. So again, we just get the u over x. So this is the inverse sine of x over two as v approaches two from the left. So I guess maybe in this case, since we actually have the inverse sine, it's better to do this. With the just standard radicals, we, we get sloppy. So, so I guess this is okay in this particular case. And I certainly would, would recommend this. So now when we have b approaching two from the left, we simply, pass to this limit once we've applied the fundamental theorem of calculus. So this will be the inverse sine of b over two minus the inverse sine of zero. Of course, the inverse sine of zero is zero. Passing to the limit would not impact this. And of course, as b approaches uh, two from the left, the argument approaches one. And we know that the inverse sine of one is pi over two. And so again, pi over two minus zero is pi over two. So we have a basic application of the improper interval and we have an infinite discontinuity, okay? So again, we'll see this again at the end of the test. Now let's go in, <clears throat> excuse me, and review a little bit of our uh, series. I think I wanted to wait to the end, <clears throat> excuse me, to do um, <clears throat> the uh, new stuff because I thought this might be a little bit rusty, maybe just a tad bit rusty. Now it says indicate whether the given series converges or diverges. If it converges, find its sum. Well, this is old hat. <clears throat> that is, we have, let me slide this down. We have cosine of k pi divided by three k and k starts at zero. Well, cosine of zero is one, cosine of pi is negative one, cosine of two pi is one, cosine of three pi is negative one. This just alternates. So the reason we can do this at all is that we can just simply replace cosine pi k as negative one to the k, just like we were solving our trig equations. So now when we look at this, we're thinking, okay, well, yeah, it converges because this is just a geometric uh, progression. So we can use the laws of exponents to write this as just, I mean, how simple is this? I mean, this is pre-cal. So we get negative one to the K as K uh, runs from zero to infinity. And this is just the convergent geometric. And so we have one divided by one minus R, A being one, R being negative one third. So we have one over four thirds, which is three quarters. And of course you had a problem like this on your third test. So, so again, we, we look at the geometric as being so important, like the Pythagorean theorem. Excuse me, think about how many times, ladies and gentlemen, we use the geometric progression to do power series representations. That, that, and again, some of you will take complex analysis when you get to the university and you'll see it again and you'll wonder, what would we do without the geometric series? I, I remember asking a complex analysis, I told you this, and she said, well, you know, I guess we'd have to just come up with something else. I said, well, I'm glad we don't have to do this. I said, we are, we are tied to it and we're creatures of habit. Now let's look at number 13. 13 says, determine whether the series converges or diverges. So we have 2K divided by K squared plus four as k equals one to infinity. So of course, when you think about this, I, I, I clearly thought about this and said, okay, well, we can, just use, we can just use limit comparison. So first what I did was factor the two 
and just say, well, two, whatever, the two doesn't matter. We're just gonna look at this and noticing that the K would absorb into the K squared as uh, K becomes uh, large, mimicking one over K. So I'm thinking, yeah, this is gonna diverge. So of course, we just let the A sub N be this generating sequence and we compare it to B sub N, which is one over K, because we're thinking that this will also diverge. So now we do the limit as K approaches infinity. And of course, I put I put N's here by, by creature of habit. So those are those should be K's. All of these actually have to be K's now. How funny. So now, now we have AK over BK, and this will be the limit as K approaches infinity of K divided by K squared plus four. And then of course the reciprocal here will just be K over one. Now, of course, when you multiply, you just get K squared over K squared plus four. And then of course, same degrees, ratio of leading coefficients, the limit will of course be one. And now of course, by the limit comparison test, this is a nice positive limit. So these generating sequences grow at the same rate. And therefore, whatever this infinite series does, this one will also do. So when we write the infinite series uh, generated by one over K, this is the harmonic series and we're done. So therefore this diverges by the limit comparison test. Again, these are simple, but, but, but often students would rather do the ratio test because they don't feel like they have to work as hard. Now, the next question, look here, this is an interesting little problem. It says determine whether the series converges or diverges, and we've got n equal one to infinity, three divided by two n to the five over four plus cosine, two times cosine of n. Okay, well, you're thinking, hmm, P, P, P series convergent type thing. Notice, if you like, let's get rid of the riffraff. We got the threes and the twos, so I just go ahead and factor the three halves and I look at this. And then, then we say, okay, let's do a little bit of, of estimation here. N to the five over four plus cosine N will be greater than or equal to N to the five over four minus one. That is the least that this can be is negative one, as long as we're looking with N greater than or equal to two. So when we look at this, we're thinking, okay, well, that's good. I agree with that, but now these are both positive. That's what I was trying to make sure I had here. I don't want to divide by zero. And so now when we reciprocate, we're going to get one over N to the five quarters minus one is greater than or equal to one over N to the fourth plus cosine N. This is what we're trying to figure out for N greater than or equal to two. Don't worry about one, it's just one number, who cares? So now we can use the P series. This clearly converges here if you just wanna do like a, a limit comparison because P is equal to N over four, the minus one having absolutely no impact on the convergence. So this is something you can easily see. And so therefore, if this converges by the direct comparison test, this series must converge. So boom, we get this series converging and therefore you can just tack on the extra term and multiply by three halves and get the convergence of the original series. So I think this is a really nice application of the direct comparison test. Again, uh, students don't like direct comparison tests because you've gotta be more clever. You have to be more clever, even for the limit comparison test. So again, you know, lots of students would look at this and say, well, you know, that's, you know, that's not gonna be, causing too much damage here. It's varying, but it's not getting crazy. So we're thinking, is it really gonna impact things and make this series diverge? Well, it doesn't. And we proved that right here. So again, this is one of these things, if you, if you were running out of time and you just looked at this intuitively, you get lucky. So we, we're always happy for luck. Uh, but of course, I would need to see something in your test work that, that gave me some idea that you had some idea of what was going on. But again, remember your test work is a quality report. I'm looking for quality of write-up. I'm looking for neatness. I'm looking for logical development. I'm looking for exact computation. 
and I'm looking for completeness. So it's, it's like a lab report where I'm doing a quality report. And so I want to see that you can write quality mathematics. And I've been very impressed with this class that you have excellent, excellent writing skills in math. It's, it's so important to be able to express yourself in a way that's coherent. So keep doing, keep doing what you do. Now, now you're thinking, well, we're getting back to the same old, same old with the power series. So with this one, ladies and gentlemen, we say, find, oh, sorry, I need to remember that I'm using my IPVO and it doesn't cover the entire screen. So here it says, find the power series representation for f of x. Well, of course, we always have Taylor series, but we are lazy. We're lazy, so we're going to use we're going to use our chart of famous series. We're going to use our geometric. We're going to use our binomial series because we spent a lot of time verifying these results. So we want to use them. So of course, with this one, we're just going to jump on the uh, geometric series wagon. So first, we see that one over three plus x can be rewritten. First, we need the one, so we just extract the one third. So this gives us one third times one over one plus X over three. Okay, so that's the standard technique that we've done many, many times. And then of course, the sum requires the negative. So we input two negatives to rewrite the plus. So of course, now we're good to go. This will be one third. And then of course, here's the, the new X, so to speak, the R negative X over three to the N. Now, of course, if you like, you can go ahead and write this in a more user-friendly way. You can factor the negative one and write negative one to the n, x to the n. And then, of course, you can let the one third or the three join the three to the n here and write this as three to the n plus one. So now for this particular problem, notice, ladies and gentlemen, that they list, they list uh, terms. So the best thing to do in a situation like this is to go ahead and write out the series and then check off a few terms. So of course we have our general uh, uh, rendering here, the infinite series, so we can let n equals zero. So that'll give us a three downstairs, a one here and a one here. So the first term is one third. And then we just move along maybe uh, two or three indices more. n equal one will give us a one ninth, a negative one, and of course, an x, so we get negative x over 9. n equal 2, again, very rudimentary. Uh, we get 2 here, so that's going to give us a 3 to the third, which is a 27. 2 here will give us a positive 1, x squared. And then, of course, if you want an additional term, n equal 3. So this will give us 3 to the fourth, which is 81. Of course, a negative 1, x to the third. So, so again, it's almost like now you look at this and you don't think anything about it. Uh, but I doubt you had any idea that the geometric progression would be so important uh, when you get to calculus. Now, here's another example that I've said many times. It's like having your integral table for, for series, having your special chart for, for famous Maclaurin series. And of course, since these are functions, uh, you can use function composition, function algebra. So I said, use a series you know. So we need the uh, uh, first three non-zero terms of the Maclaurin series for the given function. So we have the natural log of one plus two x. So we're gonna use composition. But first note, we have this nice theorem uh, chart that gives us, we derived this in class, the, uh, the Maclaurin series for the uh, natural log. And of course, these are the endpoints of the interval of convergence where we don't include and we do include. I just went ahead and showed that it shifted and compressed, even though that wasn't a part of the problem. Uh, you know, you all know how to compute uh, radii of convergence and intervals of convergence. We did so many of those, I think maybe you got tired of it. But notice here, this is just a simple substitution. So in this particular case, we just substitute one plus two X for X. And so in our series, we get one plus two X minus one. And then of course, upon reduction, we just left with a two X. So we get two to the N, X to the N. And then of course we have the negative one N minus one divided by N. So we basically got that for free. 
that's a little extra there. That's not required. And then, of course, the problem says, give us, give us uh, several terms, like three here. I think I've got four. So we can let n equal one. So we get a one here. We get the negative one to the zero. We get a one here, which gives us a two and an x. So the two's absorbed and we just get, or excuse me, two over one, we just get two x, nothing absorbed there. Now here, and I'll just go ahead and write it out and I'll absorb things over here. For the n equal two, we get a two downstairs. Two here gives us a negative, negative one. 2 here, 2 squared, and x squared, which I've written here. And then, of course, for n equal 3, we get a 3. And then, of course, a 3 here gives us a negative 1 squared, so that's positive. 2 to the 3, x to the 3, which gives us this. And then, of course, n equal 4, we get a 4 downstairs. Of course, here, this is a, a 3, so that leaves the negative. And, of course, 2 to the 4th, x to the 4th. Now, you can, you can reduce this. This is fixed. Of course, here the two's absorbed to leave us with a negative two x squared, four divided by two. Here, we don't get any absorbing. We get eight over three x cubed. And then of course here, we've got the 16 divided by four, which is four with the negative x to the four. So again, I like how these problems are set up. Uh, you, you are pretty good at computing an interval of convergence. So, so if you want to do more of those, please review that with your quizzes and tests. Uh, I, like I say, I, I did so much with that, it was, it was maybe overkill. Um, but, but again, remember that, that you can always apply the technique, but if you're utilizing the, the, the actual chart, you, can, you get the cheat mode. You just can do the substitution and get it for free. So, so that's always a blessing using the chart. We pay for it. It's like we worked on it. So let's use it. Let's get Let's get the uh, output. Now, again, we, we'd be remiss if we didn't say something about the binomial series. So here it says, find the first four terms of the binomial series for the given function and hint binomial theorem. Uh, kind of, you need that hint after they say this. Well, maybe that's a little bit much on my part. So again, I, I just attack this like I taught you. Notice we're going to have the negative two choose n. That is here, the k is negative two. So this is exactly how I taught you. If n is greater than or equal to one, of course, we'll have the one here as the zero term because often web assign will start the series at zero and then they'll have this uh, where you do this computation. Well, notice here, again, we get a negative two, we subtract one, we keep subtracting. So then of course we end with negative two minus n plus a one. That's the falling factorial that, that of course, I teach my pre-cal kids. And then you all, of course, uh, remember from pre-cal when we do this. Now, notice we have the n factorial downstairs. But what's interesting about this is that this absorbs, so to speak. Notice here we basically have the n factorial. And we've got how many factors here? We've got n factors of the negative. So just go ahead, like I've done before, extract the negative here. And, and of course, notice in this particular case, when you extract the negative, you get an n plus two uh, minus a one, which leaves an n plus one. And of course, that's n factorial right there, and that's n factorial. So the only thing, or n plus one factorial. So the only thing that survives here is just the n plus one, the n factorial's absorbing. So the, so wow, don't we wish they all were this simple? But of course, that's a negative integer. So of course, it's going to look nice. One halves, one fourths, things like that. They, they are much more um, time consuming, as you've seen uh, that when we uh, work through these in the uh, lecture notes. So, so this is a nice application of the binomial theorem, where now we get negative 1 to the n times n plus 1, n greater than or equal to 1. So now, of course, our f of x, we'll put in our first term, n equals 0. And then we can use this to generate the rest of them. Again, let's just go ahead and fill this in. Notice we have x over 4 to the n. So that's going to give us x to the n divided by 4 to the n. And then the extra additional part of the generating sequence, we just fit in right here. And so we've got n equal 1. So that's going to give us a 4. It gives us a negative a two, 
and an X. So we get that term, just filling that in, then we'll reduce N equal two. Notice here we get four squared, which will give us a 16, N equal two, a positive one. N equal two here gives us a three, X squared, that term right there. N equal three, uh, four to the third gives us a 64, N equal three gives us the negative one, N equal three, four, X to the third, this term here. And now of course we can reduce the two absorbs into the four, so that will give us a one minus a one half X. Of course, this is reduced three over 16 X squared. And then of course, four absorbing into the 64 to give us a 16 or negative one sixteen X cubed. So, so what you're gonna find as engineers and all, you know, just like when we were doing the Taylor's theorem and things of that nature, um, that, that we, we would figure out how many terms we needed to have a particular uh, accuracy. And so again, um, it's almost really to your advantage to always write out just a few terms just to check to see what you have. And that's kind of how I taught you to do that by doing those little approximation methods uh, with the uh, uh, remainder theorems. And, and of course, the, the first neglected term with the alternating series, how nice is that? I mean, there, there's some, some really elegant things that occur in series that are, aren't too terribly difficult. But, but yeah, we learned that those are few and far between, unfortunately. Okay, now what we wanna do is now go back. Again, like I say, use this review test as just a way to, to apprise you of things that we've done. And then of course, go into other uh, old quizzes and tests and just pick random problems again. Again, the, the, the final exam will be a more general rendering of what we've done. Uh, again, similar number of questions maybe as we have on this particular practice test, but certainly doable problems. And, and of course, as I always give you plenty of time to do it. Now look at this one, look at number 18. The rest of the problems basically cover some of the new stuff. So, there's more coverage, I guess, percentage wise with the new, but remember the new stuff is basically an entire chapter. So there might be one, you know, one problem or uh, one and a half problems from the, uh, the five sections, the conics, the, the, the parametric, the calculus of the parametric, the polar and the calculus of the polar. So, so again, a fairly even distribution. Now let's look at the first one, start out with a very straightforward problem. Here it says, obtain the Cartesian equation of the curve by eliminating the parameter. You had a, a, a web assigned problem like this. And of course I've talked about this in class. So we have X is equal to seven cosine T and Y is equal to four sine T. You had your um, uh, a problem in your homework like this. And so these are parametric equations. And so of course, the, the easiest way to eliminate the parameter is to isolate the cosine and the sine. So of course, this is gonna be an ellipse. So we get X over seven is cosine T and Y over four is sine T, kind of like when we're doing the hypocycloid, you know, and, and, and again, making the assignments in a way that, that gets you where you want to go. So now of course, as we square X over seven and we square Y over four, uh, the sum of those squares will now be cosine squared plus sine squared, which is our fundamental identity. So now, of course, we get x squared over 49 plus y squared over 16. And of course, this is an ellipse uh, where the uh, 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 foci are contained on the horizontal axis. Uh, we have uh, vertices uh, plus or minus seven, and then of course, a squared minus uh, b squared is c squared. So again, just reminding you of, of what you did uh, in, in your pre-calculus days. Very straightforward. And again, something you do without thinking about it. Now, here, I just wanted to take a little bit just to remind you of the Cartesian derivative. Remember everyone, the second Cartesian derivative is bound up in, in the recursion formula. So when you take a second Cartesian derivative, you're actually taking the derivative of the first Cartesian derivative divided by x prime. 
So it's not, it's not just, it's not a vector derivative like you do in physics. Like if you've got a vector function, if you get the second derivative, you just take the second derivative of all the coordinate functions. That's very different. That's curve theory. But, and, and that's what we're doing here. But when we're trying to recoup the Cartesian derivative, that's very different. And so you can't oversimplify these things. And if you do, you'll just get the wrong answer. So please, please uh, take a time to go back through my derivation of this because it's extremely important. We've used it over and over. Now, notice here, we have x is equal to the natural log of 2t and y is equal to e to the 2t. So what we want to do is compute the Cartesian derivative. Well, first, just, just for simplicity here, we notice that this is just the log of a uh, product. So I can just write this as log of t uh, plus log t. Not required, but, but why not? And then, of course, y is just e to the 2t. So now upon differentiation, the uh, natural log here goes to 0, and we just get 1 over t. And then, of course, y prime would just be 2 e to the 2t. So now the theorem we derive using the chain rule, that is, we get y prime divided by x prime. So this will be 2 e to the 2t divided by 1 over t. Upon reciprocation, we get 2t e to the 2t. So again, remember, remember the Cartesian derivative, like those problems we did with the tangent lines, allows us to actually uncover the Cartesian derivative from the parametric representation as long as we have smooth curves. And so we can compute horizontal tangent, vertical tangents, and then the non-horizontal like we did with the uh, uh, tangent line equations. So, so this is a very, very powerful result and we've used it over and over and over. So, so uh, I'm glad we, we've gotten a good use of it. Now, notice this is what I was alluding to for before when we we're talking about um, improper integrals that arise when we're trying to compute uh, an arc length, and we've got that pesky radical hanging out, but we're we're at least at a point where we can apply some algebra to to render uh, an integrand that we can actually anti-differentiate. So here's a nice example that's similar to ones that we've already done in the course uh, with the polar coordinates and also with the parametric uh, in, in section three. Just remember that we always, we always respect, we always respect the trigonometry. We always respect the arithmetic of the unit circle. That's what you learned in pre-cal. And, and my students in pre-cal who, who have managed to, to understand trig respect the uh, algebra and the uh, arithmetic of the unit circle. So this particular problem is actually tailor-made like a web assigned problem. It says find the length of the parametric curve defined over the given interval. So we have x is equal to 4 sine t plus 4t and y is equal to 4 cosine t and we're already given the limits on t 0 to pi. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Not an overly long problem, but an, 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 an important problem as to technique. Now notice, notice when you start with these parametric equations, and this is something we derived in class. First, we, we figured out using the Cartesian derivative that we can rewrite the actual formula for the arc length. So what we did in this case, First, we compute the derivatives, and this gives us a 4 cosine t plus 4 here. And of course, we can factor the 4 to write this. And then for the y prime here, we'll just get a negative 4 sine t, the derivative of cosine being the negative sign. So good, good to go there. Now, of course, the actual formula requires that we square the derivatives of x and y and add them. Again, this becomes Pythagorean as we expect. So of course the four is squared to give us a 16. And then of course, as we square everything, again, the binomial cosine squared plus two times cosine t plus one, and then plus a sine squared, again, again squaring the negative sine t 
gives us a sine squared. So very straightforward, good old trig. And so now notice we get the sine squared plus the cosine squared is one, one plus one is two. And of course that gives us two cosine t plus two. So now when we look at this, we can go ahead and factor the two to give us a 32 times cosine t plus one. Again, that's what we do. That's what we do even when we were uh, back in chapter seven, we would do the, the uh, algebraic work first and then move uh, to the integrand. So now, of course, we need to take the square root of this, the principal square root. So of course, this is just two times 16, obviously here, uh, should have just left it as two times 16. That'll be four times the square root of two, of course, times the square root of one plus cosine t. So this is the integrand here. Uh, we have seen worse. And so, uh, like I say, as you continue your work in engineering and physics, you will run into the elliptic integral. Uh, maybe you want to go the other direction, but elliptic integrals do come up and they are Pythagorean in, in, in a skewed sense. <laughs> and so they're, they're, their treatise is written on elliptic integrals and uh, they, they, they occur often enough that, that they get plenty of attention. So now notice, just like we did before, we need to come up with some kind of uh, formula for the integrand, just like we did when we were computing the arc length of the lima sine. Remember, we had a cardioid and we divided it up into two pieces and doubled each piece. So we got a formula for each section and, and work that out so that we could actually anti-differentiate correctly. But what we're gonna find here is that when we look at this integrand, let's go ahead and do the same kind of algebra. Let's multiply and divide by the convenience of the conjugate here. We just take one minus cosine t to the one half power using this algebra, which you learned in pre-cal in uh, calculus one. So of course now, uh, with the laws of exponents, we just get the one minus the cosine squared, which we have here. And then of course, downstairs, this is fixed, just one minus cosine t to the one half. Again, this is where the issue comes that goes away upon anti-differentiation. So I've noticed, noted that here, that I just haven't ignored it. It's just that the, the integral will converge. So that's something you can do as you get more and more experience. It's not, it's not noticing or neglecting to notice, it's noticing and, and realizing that you will get convergence upon anti-differentiation. Now, notice here, we just basically have sine squared to the one half, which by definition is the absolute value of sine t. But now when we go back to the original uh, restrictions on t, we see that the sine function here is non-negative. So we can relieve ourselves of the radical excuse me, of the absolute values. Remember on the previous problem, we had two, uh, two parts uh, because the sign did change and we didn't have the luxury that we have here. So this is nice. The lima sign moved into the lower arc of the unit circle and we all bets were off. So again, we had to respect the uh, arithmetic of the unit circle. So now this gives us four root two sine t divided by the square root of one minus cosine t to the one half. Noticing at zero, this is an infinite discontinuity, which I've talked about here. So we're okay with that upon anti-differentiation. Now notice here, when we think of the u, when we think of actually writing this table ready, we've got one minus cosine t is the u, but of course the derivative of the uh, cosine is the negative sign. So this gives us the positive sine t dt. So notice how nice this is. Table ready. We've got, the, we've got the sine t here. We've got the radical, which we can move upstairs with the negative one half and the four uh, root two. So table ready. Didn't have to work nearly as hard with this one as we did for the lima sign. And so now when we factor and notice here, or excuse me, factor this and then add one divide by the new power, so this will give us division by one half, which is multiplication by two, the square root of one minus cosine t. So now we can pass to the limit. Basically here, uh, we're letting uh, uh, 
T approach uh, zero from the right. So this limit exists now. So again, we're, we're okay with this. So when we look at this, this will give us A root two, and then we can substitute pi for T. So this will give us one minus cosine pi to the one half as we have for the upper limit. And then for the lower limit, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have one minus cosine zero to the one half. But of course, this is just one minus one. So that gives us a zero. And notice here, we get one minus a negative one, which is a positive two. So we get the square root of two. So now we see we have eight times the square root of two times the square root of two, which is eight times the square root of two quantity squared, which gives us eight times two, which is 16. So, so this, this is a common theme. I've talked about this uh, several times uh, as we've worked through uh, the new material in chapter 10. And, and this, this is, it's not like, okay, I can't do this. I, you know, I don't, I'm not getting something I can integrate. Do I need to use my integral table? Well, you know, you could use an integral table, but this technique is fairly straightforward and it's better to run this uh, using, using the algebra that we have here. So we have some confidence in it. There's one thing, you know, like I say, the, the, the techniques that we can use uh, the integral table for are always uh, many, um, but in this case, we don't really have to go that route. This is a doable integral and, and, and a technique that, that, that you should feel comfortable with. So that's a very nice problem, but I've said that before. I think I'll probably say that about any math problem. Now, let's look what, see what we have here. Um, the next problem here says the following, and these are, these are very algebraic and very straightforward. It says, for the given rectangular equation, write an equivalent polar equation. Okay, so you're like, oh, how simple. So we just have what? X squared plus Y squared equals 64. Well, that, that just means in this case, that's just a circle centered at the origin of radius eight. So how simple is that? Well, of course, this using the uh, uh, tran well not translation equations, but the uh, the polar uh, equivalents, we have r squared equals 64. So therefore, r is plus or minus the square root of 64. So we could write r as eight or r equal negative eight. Of course, r equal negative eight makes sense. We just shoot through the origin and we just trace the circle in a different uh, direction, a different uh, path. But that's okay. There's no problem with that. We tend to focus more on this one because that one's a little bit awkward. So, so you could choose either of these. What we see that, that, that you'll often see in other coordinate systems is that certain geometric figures are so much simpler in the new coordinate system, which we found with the polar. When you think about the lemniscate, you think about the lemasons, you think about the circles, you think about the rose curves. They are so simple in the uh, polar form. Um, so, so we don't, you know, we decide to invent new coordinate systems when we need something that's more tractable, even though in some cases, even the best situation is still very complicated. So that was a very straightforward application. Now, The next equation is this, it says for the given polar equation. So this is just basically, do you know the uh, trans, the, well, I'll say the, the, uh, the function equations in their inverses. That's how we set this up. So I should say, do you know the inverse equations instead of translation equations? So now we've got for the polar equation, write an equivalent rectangular equation. That is R squared sine two theta equals 24. Well, when we look at this, we, we think just like we do in calculus one. Notice, notice here we have r squared times two sine theta equals 24, where we have our inverse equations, that is x equal r cosine theta, y equal r sine theta, which are basically the polar equation, transformation equations that we started with. And that's, I think, what I was looking for, transformation. I kept thinking translation, but transformation equations. And this is what we showed uh, for r positive and zero to two pi is one to one. And that's extremely important. And we did that using basic techniques. So now what we can do is say, okay, first, 
This is the sine of the double angle. So we get r squared times two sine theta cosine theta equals 24. And now if you like, what we wanna do is, is rig this so that we uh, get rid of the r's and the theta, so to speak. Well, first, that's why I wrote these here. Notice that sine theta will just be y over r and cosine theta will be x over r. So now upon substitution, we get r squared times y over r times x over r equals 12. And of course the r squares absorb and we're just left with what? xy equal 12. And now of course that's just a conjugate hyperbola. That is y is equal to 12 over x. This is the rotated hyperbola. And of course the, the rotation equations uh, you'll learn about in uh, linear algebra, uh, but this is a very beautiful um, uh, transformation uh, with, with conic sections. Rarely do I ever have time to teach this. I, I did it one time in an honors course where, where it was just part of the curriculum, um, but, but I did so much extra stuff in my regular pre-cal this term, I didn't even have time to, to go over this. And uh, maybe, maybe I'll sneak in a problem tomorrow when I, when I see them, but, but it's a really nice, nice application. And, and this is kind of the freebie. This is what you talk about in college algebra, not even thinking of it as a rotated hyperbola. Okay, so now, of course, here is our Cartesian equation. And so you're thinking, you know, we'll take this one here. This is better. This seems somewhat of a nightmare. We like this one. So, so again, you can, you can see that the Cartesian will be an improvement over the polar, or here the polar is an improvement over the Cartesian. But we're so, we're so used to the equation of the circle, I, I don't think we'd ever be remiss with that. But this is so simple, so, so entirely simple. But we just have to remember the coordinate system and respect that. Okay, now, here, this is, this is what we did a lot of uh, at the beginning of, of uh, section four on polar coordinates. Here it says, graph the polar equation. So basically here, we wanna use the, anytime we do a problem with polar coordinates, we really need to know what we're working with. I mean, if we're trying to find a region area, if we're trying to rotate something, a curve about an axis or whatever, um, or we need, we need to be able to have some kind of visual of what's going on so that we're not just walking in the dark. So in this particular case, let's look at this we have r is equal to seven times sine three theta. Now this is a good one because it just gives us an interesting uh, 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 period. So notice here, this is, the, this is the rose curve. Now, when you do the rose curve, you've got your, your nice uh, cheat sheet here. So remember, when you have the argument of the uh, cosine or sine function, in this case, if the argument uses an end that's odd, you have that many petals or that many leaves, so to speak. And that's what's summarized right here in your uh, nice little chart on the uh, more popular uh, polar curves, the limousine, the, the uh, rose curves, the circles, and the lemniscus or the figure eights. So now what we can do in order to get this from this, first, what we wanna do is figure out the new period. Of course, that's gonna be two pi divided by three. And then, you know, Professor Ron's technique is to divide this by four so we can get those principal points to make our life easy. I do this every time. I, I teach my pre-cal kids this way. And so of course, this will be two pi uh, divided by a three times a four. Of course, the uh, two will absorb into the uh, four and give us a pi over six. So what we can do is just mark off five points that, that create uh, four subintervals of length pi over six that give us those principal points that make graphing this very simple. I mean, I'm sure you've done this before. I'm, not, I, I'm just reminding you that's what I'm doing. So now, of course, we'll have zero pi over six, uh, four, excuse me, two pi over six, three pi over six, and four pi over six. 
So the idea here is I don't reduce any of these just to keep track of the pi over sixes. So it's easy to see that. And then what I did, I went ahead and moved on uh, over, just did another period from four pi over six, five pi over six, six pi over six, seven pi over six, and eight pi over six. Again, write, write maybe a period and a half or whatever. If you need to use it, fine. If you don't, you, you didn't lose any time, really. So now, when we look at this, notice we have an amplitude of seven. So you can just mark off the seven here and then just put some arrows here to notate particular values of the radius. So now we have an independent variable theta and a dependent variable r, which we can translate this into the polar graph very simply. So notice, notice here, and this, this gives us the angles that we need. And that's why this technique is, is so simple and, and so easy to use. So notice we start out at zero and I've traced this so you can see what's going on. We start out at zero and we grow all the way to seven at the angle pi over six here. And then notice the value of R decreases back to zero as we get to two pi over six. So it's like that's pi over three. So decrease, 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 decrease. And this new value here is just the pi over three right here. I didn't note that, notate that, but you can see that. And then notice here, and this is what's interesting about this. Notice this is pi over two, but this is negative. So instead of being up here, we shoot through the origin. So we're doing basically uh, uh, reflection through the origin to move down to what? Seven here which is negative using the negative r at pi over three. So instead of here, we're here shooting through the origin. And then notice the value of r increases that it becomes less negative back to zero. So again, we move this way to four pi over six or two pi over three angle. And then of course, again, so you can see the lines here, the little arrows that tell us, and then we move to five pi over six, which is here, to the extended value of seven again. So we move this way all the way to five pi over six. And then of course, the value of R decreases again to zero as we get to pi. So notice we just slide back in here at pi and we've completed the curve. So what I wrote here is that for, for this part of the curve, we generate one, this part, for this part of the Cartesian curve, we generate to this leaf or this petal. And for this part of the curve, we generate this, like I said in lecture. But notice that's all we needed. We just needed this part to get the complete curve. And that can vary uh, depending on uh, the, the, the actual uh, argument here. So, so again, we can see that there's never a need to plot points. If we plot any points, it's only to maybe to draw in an angle just so that we have some type of way to set up the curve so it's believable. And of course, this curve's not going to look, you know, more like Picasso than Rembrandt. But what we can see is that the, the basic construct of moving from the Cartesian graph to the polar graph is so simple. And it uses what you already know. You can do these graphs in your head, but this little technique here, if you used before, fine. If not, it keeps you from having to do transformations that can take up a lot of time. This just gives you principal points that are easy to plot. Do not reduce, just keep them. And, and as you think about them, you can reduce them in your head. But this way, this is how I teach my kids to get their uh, trig graphs correct for the first time. They're always like, well, I'm gonna use a fancy calculator. And like my student who's a, are going to be a nuclear engineer in the spring, he used to tutor in the tutoring center, and the kids would come in in Cal 3, and they come in in pre-Cal, and we, we, we can't graph any of this. He says, well, what's your parent function? Uh, what, it, what do you mean parent function? Well, you know, Professor Ron, parent function. Oh, we don't, we don't know how to do that, and he's too theoretical anyway. We don't understand him, and then the, my, my student said, well, shame, shame on you, because if you had listened to him or you had taken his class, you'd know how to do it. And that's very true. And so this student now is going to be a nuclear engineer. And I think he's actually going to finish with an advanced degree. So 
it's amazing. It's amazing what you can do if you just set up some techniques that, that get you from square one to square two without too much damage, okay? So I thought that was always a funny story because he says you need to know your parent functions and he was, he was serious. So um, it's always interesting to see how people actually take what you try to teach them and how they can use it in their courses. And I'm, I'm surprised he didn't become a math double major. I think he got bit by the math bug and maybe that's why he ended up in nuclear engineering because there's a lot of physics and math in that curriculum. Okay, now, the next one here, this says, find the area of the specified region. Okay, it says inside the three leaf rows, another rows curve, because these make really good examples. And we did some in lecture where you have some other curves that you should review. I thought this would be a nice way to, to take what I just taught you with the rows curve and apply this uh, to an area problem like we did with the interlocking circles. So you, could, you can change the leaf to petal if you want. And notice we have a six, and then of course we have the three theta here. Now, when you do these problems, maybe, maybe the problem only asks you to find the area in one petal, okay? But notice, notice here, we've got this beautiful symmetry going on. And so we really just have to compute the area of one pedal and hit that with a three. That's all we have to do to get all three pedals. So how do you how do you do this with any kind of confidence? You know, you, you, you've got to think, well, what, what am I dealing with? I know I've got some nice symmetry here. I know I have three pedals. So to, to be able to execute the problem without feeling like you've left out half the, the, the content is go ahead and get a quick Cartesian graph, just like we did before. Notice now we've got the uh, same period, two pi over three, which we can break up into uh, uh, divide by four to get the five points, the four subintervals of equal length pi over six, just like we did before. And so here we'll have a zero pi over six, two pi over six, three pi over six, four pi over six, et cetera. Just move on down. So here's one period, and here this moves us to the next one. But notice this is a cosine function in this case. So the petals will be distributed differently. But what I've done here is notice we can, we're going to mark out in this particular case, we're going to start here. And, and, and the curve, the actual value of R, again, starts out at six. So we're right here. We're right here. We start out here, not at the origin, and we decrease to pi over six, so the value of r decreases down to zero, okay? Theta equal pi over six, that, that uh, uh, line right there. And then notice, notice, again, we've got the negative values, so you're thinking we're here, but we shoot through the origin and we create this pedal here. And then back in this particular case at uh, pi over two. So we, we, we move in right, move in, angle pi over two, just like that. And then we start curving over to two pi over three, to hit that six right there, two pi over three, right there. Then we decrease again, back to five pi over six, right there, five pi over six. And then we complete, we complete the first pedal as we move in this particular case from pi to seven pi over six. So again, notice, notice what's going on in this, excuse me, uh, from pi pi over six to pi. Notice we would be over here, but we're negative. We're negative here. So we shoot through the origin to complete this piece here. So this identity with negative R's we use over and over. And you can see how this convention makes sense here. If we didn't have the directed distance in R, this would not even be possible. So again, just remember the negative R means reflection through the origin. Now, how do we how do we set this up in a way that makes it doable? Well, here's notice we've got all this nice symmetry here. So what we can do is just look at this particular part here. See this half of this, this part right here? If you look, we go from zero to pi over six. So notice what I've done here in my analysis is I let theta live 
between zero and pi over six, and I double for one petal. So I double that result using my area formula for one petal, then multiply area by three to get area of all petals. So we're using symmetry twice. We're using symmetry to get the area of one petal and then using the fact that all of the petals are, uh, enclose the same area due to how they're constructed. All of these are, are just shifted. The curves are just shifts of each other, they're equivalent. So, so by virtue of this, we get all of these leaves enclosing the same area. So notice we got this nice little simple formula using the uh, sector area of a circle. Remember we did the Riemann sum to validate this definition. So area is one half alpha to beta r squared d theta. Now, so what I've done first is I've got the three here for symmetry and the two here for symmetry. So go ahead and knock those out first. And then, you know, that pesky one half, it's like the pi and the two pi in the volumes of the solids of revolution. You, you know, you, you leave it out and, and it, it just, it's a thorn in your side. So transfer this here, remembering this for symmetry. And now of course we have the R squared. So we get six squared, which is 36, cosine squared, three theta. So now of course, we're, we're back to uh, calculus one and pre-cal. We'll just use the reduction formula. So in this case, for cosine squared three theta, we'll just use what one plus cosine six theta divided by two using the reduction. Remember, one plus cosine six theta divided by two, and of course the one half we just remove here. Now notice these absorb, so I got rid of that and we just have a three. And notice here, this is an 18, which we can just extract. Now, of course, this, this is fairly simple. I mean, we've reduced this to pretty much the simplest antiderivative you can imagine. So for one, we get theta. And then of course, the antiderivative of cosine is the positive sign, but we need the chain rule. So we're gonna get one sixth sine of six theta. So now basically all we have to do is apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. So we have three times 18. So let's substitute pi over six. So we'll get pi over six plus one sixth. And then of course, six times pi over six is pi. Minus, now we'll substitute zero. Well, you know, we know what that's gonna be. Zero plus one sixth sine of zero. But I've just notated here that both of these are clearly zero using the arithmetic of the unit circle. And so now we have three times 18 times pi over six. Of course, the six absorbs into the 18 to give us a three. Three times three is nine, so we get nine pi. So this is a very elegant calculation that's made simple, made simple using symmetry. And also, again, you know, the, the, graphs, the graphs have the inherent symmetry, which makes the area calculations doable. I mean, let's face it, polar, polar equations can, can, can get messy really fast. And so, so when you think about what we're doing, we're certainly uh, utilizing the, the symmetrical aspect of these curves. And, and that's one reason that we can rely upon the polar coordinate uh, representation uh, because it utilizes the, 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 the beautiful symmetry that we have in the, in the Cartesian graph. So the Cartesian to the polar, again, respecting the difference, but seeing how we can translate one to the other is, is really uh, what's going on here. Uh, remember, uh, as an undergraduate, I figured out this technique. It was actually uh, in Thomas and Finney calculus, they adopted a, a new book uh, after the Swarkowski and I read it and, and they had a nice little section on this. And I thought how neat to think of the Cartesian as a trans, as a way to transfer to the polar graph without having to plot points. You can see plotting points would be just a, a, a big mistake here. That's not gonna help you out. Here are all the points you need right here. And they're, they're set up in a way that, that, that makes sense. Now, the last problem, again, I think was, is one that we've done uh, thinking about the uh, polar 
uh, forms of the Cartesian. Remember when we did the uh, arc length of the Limasan? So, so this one, this one's actually just a good general purpose problem. It says find the slope of the polar curve at the indicated point. So remember when you did the problems where you had parametric and you, you found the Cartesian derivative and then you wrote the equation of the tangent line? Well, this could be a similar problem where, where you write the equation of the tangent line. So same, same difference. But this utilizes what we uh, often use many times uh, in our uh, translation. So let me, let me get this to, sorry about that, a little bit fuzzy. Good. There we go. So now, again, let's just kind of remind ourselves how we did this calculation. We have r equals three cosine three theta, and we want the Cartesian derivative at pi over three. So first what I did, and I reminded you that when you do the Cartesian derivative, ladies and gentlemen, especially since the, the, the numerator is the x prime, and the denominator is the y prime, it might behoove you to write it this way so you don't flip them around, but that's just a little hint. So we have y is equal to r sine theta, and we have x is equal to r cosine theta. So first, what we want to do is remind ourselves that dy dx will then, of course, be y prime divided by x prime, where we consider r to be a differentiable function of theta. So of course, by the like as we've done before many times, this will give us r prime sine theta plus r cosine theta by the product rule, and then of course uh, in the denominator for x prime we get r prime cosine theta, and then of course r times the derivative of the cosine, which is the negative sign. So we get this. Now. In order to substitute, we just look at our original uh, function here for r and take its derivative. So by the chain rule, uh, the derivative of the cosine is the negative sine three theta. And then of course, we have the three already and chain rule gives us the three. So this will give us a negative sine, excuse me, negative nine sine three theta. Again, very simple, but very important. No part of the problem is unimportant, unfortunately. Um, and, and, and we find really in, in pre-Cal, Cal 1, Cal 2, and you'll see even more so in Cal 3, uh, when you do curve theory problems, when you do um, uh, plane and tangent plane problems, I mean, simple problems, you think, oh, this is easy. And then you get to uh, the optimization of functions of two variables and Lagrange multipliers and, and uh, triple integrals and, and, and tangent planes or, or surface parameterizations, then it all blows up. So, so, so always look at Cal 3 as, as, as a work in progress and don't, don't assume it's gonna be easy because it won't be. So now notice when we substitute, we have R prime, so we get a negative nine sine three theta times sine theta, plus again, R three cosine three theta times cosine theta right here. And then of course, downstairs R prime negative nine sine theta times cosine theta, and then minus r three cosine three theta, and then of course, sine theta. So this is just substituting into our uh, Cartesian derivative formula theorem using the polar transformation. And so this is our Cartesian derivative. So now all we have to do is just substitute theta equal pi over three because we want to find the actual Cartesian derivative at theta equal pi over three. So now, of course, as we substitute the three theta, this will give us a pi. So a negative nine sine pi, and then of course sine of pi over three. And then of course we have three cosine three theta, and that'll absorb the three, so we get cosine of pi, and then cosine pi over three. Downstairs, we get a negative sine, and then of course the pi because of the three, and then a cosine in this case, this is a pi over three. Let me write that in. It zeroes out, but I need to write it correctly. And then of course here, we have a minus three uh, cosine of three theta. Again, the threes absorb and we get pi. And then of course, sine of pi over three. Now notice the sine of pi is zero and the sine of pi is zero here. So both of these zero out. And these are the only two terms that are non-zero. At least we do have a, 
of a derivative, uh, which is nice. And so now, of course, we have three times what negative one cosine of pi times cosine of pi over three, which is one half. And then here, of course, we have a negative three times the cosine of pi, which is negative one, and then the sine of pi over three, uh, which is root three over t. So of course, now uh, when we when we look at this and we think about what we're doing, um, the negatives absorb, so that gives us a three. And then of course we have a negative three halves from the numerator, and then we just flip this. So this gives us three root three uh, downstairs, and the two makes its way upstairs. Of course, the twos absorb, and then of course the negative three and the three absorb to give a negative one. So we get negative one over root three, which is fine. And of course, if you wanted to rationalize, uh, which is what my pre-cal students always want to do, you can do that. But there, there is absolutely nothing wrong with this. So, so the idea here is that remember when when you were doing the problems in the section three, you were given you were given the actual parameter value, but you had to do the trig equation to find the x and the y. Notice here we didn't have to do that. But when you're doing those types of problems, just remember, depending on what it is you have to do, you may have to solve some fairly straightforward um, trig equations to find a common value of the parameter. And remember, in most cases, these are not one-to-one -one functions. I mean, so, so you just make sure that you find the value of the parameter uh, that, that's consistent between the equ equations. And it doesn't have to be a beautiful number. I, I was telling uh, a student that, that as long as you find something that's close to something in the first quadrant or whatever that's easy to compute, that's probably what you want to try to do uh, to cut down on the arithmetic. Uh, but, but again, how, how, how you see arithmetic is, is, is always a, a, a point for each individual person. So now, like I say, this, these uh, problems, um, again, I've written this up and I posted this on um, uh, Blackboard. So again, as you continue to work with uh, these uh, ideas, if you're already comfortable with the new stuff that I went over, then that's great. Go ahead and knock out your homework and, and, and be fine with that and then go back and review some of the topics from your old quizzes. A lot of times students just go back to the old practice test and work through those, or they just go back to old tests on WebAssign and, and work through those, just spot check. So don't, don't worry that you feel like you have to do every problem. Just go to areas where you know you need some review. And for each student, that's something you have to determine. But, but today, what I would like you to do is to go ahead and map out a time when you plan to take the test, map it out with, with what other obligations you have, because I'm sure you have other tests that you have to take, and go ahead and set up a schedule for that. Uh, and just remember that, that once you're done with your final, uh, I will grade the finals once the, the uh, time has uh, expired for the due date, and then, uh, then you're done, then you're done. So you can, you can prop your feet up and, and, and job well done kind of thing. So, so again, just make sure, make sure that you map out your time so that you have a comfortable time to take the test. Uh, have, you know, have your note cards and things, your integral tables, your polar uh, coordinate charts and things like that. Uh, your, your table of good, good power series uh, available. So as you work that you can use them. Uh, I appreciate your attention to a nice write up. Once you, again, be careful as you submit, as, uh, once you scan your papers uh, into, one, into one file, do a careful submission on Blackboard because that's important. Remember 60%, 40%. And as far as I can tell by looking at the grade distribution, uh, by, by scoring your uh, test this way, uh, you're getting more credit for a quality write-up. And so, so it's actually working in your favor. Uh, I'm very pleased with that. And, and, and I sleep better knowing uh, that you're writing good mathematics. Again, remember, it's a quality report. I look for neatness organization. I look for uh, exact computation. I look for logical deduction. And I look for completeness. Those are the four areas that you've noticed that I grade. And that will be the same for the final. So 
Uh, I will be holding office hours this week. Uh, boy, it'd be nice to, uh, you know, to, to, to give you all time to do other things and maybe I could do some other things too. But, but I will certainly be available uh, today and tomorrow and probably on into the end of the week. I'll send, I'll send the uh, announcements out. So if you have questions that come up, you can certainly come to my office hours. I will be available. I'm always available. Um, and, and again, take advantage of that if you need it. So I will say stay, uh, stay warm. Uh, maybe we're gonna get a little bit cooler as the, a little bit warmer as the week progresses, uh, but stay warm and take care of yourself. I'm doing the same. Uh, I, I, sometimes on Sundays, I eat too much after church. And then of course I don't sleep as well. And so I had to get up this morning and run just to kind of get the energy back. So be careful about what you eat, drink plenty of water, keep your system, you know, flushed. You don't want toxins in your system. So just take care of yourself that way. I think it does make a big difference. So you all have a good day and please come to see me at office hours if I can help you. Have a good day.